read. I'm going to read through the whole chapter so we can catch up from last week and tie this all together. <clears throat> Revelation 19. After these things, I heard something like a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and power belong to our God because his judgments are true and righteous. For he has judged the great harlot who was corrupting the earth and with her immorality, and he has avenged the blood of his bondservants on her. And a second time they said, Hallelujah, her smoke rises up forever and ever. And the twenty-four elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshipped God who sits on the throne, saying, Amen, Hallelujah. And a voice <clears throat> came from the throne, saying, Give praise to our God, all you his bondservants who fear him, the small and the great. Then I heard something like the voice of a great multitude, and like the sound of many orders, and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder, saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty, reigns. And as we looked at last week, remember, Hallelujah is mentioned four times in the New Testament, all right here. It's not any place else in the New Testament. So that means Hallelujah is praise Yahweh. So praise Yahweh, praise Yahweh. And it gets louder and louder and more intense as it goes. Let us rejoice and be glad and give the glory to him. For the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made her herself ready. It was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean. For the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Then he said to me, Write, Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Then I fell at his feet to worship him, but he said, Do not do that. I am a fellow servant of yours and your brethren, who hold the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on it is called Faithful and True, and righteousness. Um, and in righteousness he judges and wages war. His eyes are a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems. And he has a name written on him which no one knows except himself. He is clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. That was all last week. Now we're going to finish off the chapter here. And the armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword, so that with it he may strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God, the Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried out with a loud voice, saying to all the birds which fly in mid-heaven, Come, assemble for the great supper of God, so that you may eat the flesh of kings, and the flesh of commanders, and the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses, and of those who sit on them, and the flesh of all men, both free men and slaves, small and great. And I saw the beast, and the kings of the earth, and their armies assembled to make war against him who sat on the horse, and against his army. And the beast was seized, and the and the false prophet who performed the signs in his presence, by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast, and those who worshipped his image. By these, uh, these two were thrown alive into the lake of fire which burns with brimstone. And the rest were killed with the sword which came out from the mouth of him who sat on the horse. And all the birds were filled with their flesh. Now let's break that down verse by verse and we'll see what God's showing us today. Uh, Revelation 19, 4, uh, 14. And the armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. Now obviously that's going to be an amazing sight to see this amount of people coming down out of the sky on horses. I mean, it, it just goes without description here. This is just going to blow our mind. And imagine the people standing on the earth when it says they do battle against the Lord. If they're told that's not the Lord, they're seeing a bunch of creatures coming out of the sky with people on their backs. <laughs> What are they going to think that is? Aliens. Probably. Because I can't, in my mind, grasp the fact that you're going to people on the earth saying, let's fight against God. Get the tanks ready. Get your mortars set. Put some landmines out. Like, it just doesn't even make sense. But they're gathering for battle. And that's what we're seeing back here in the sixth bowl judgment. Now, who is in the army? Anybody know? Us. Yeah, our us. Yeah. Anybody else? Saints before us. Saints before us. Anybody else? Angels. Angels. Yeah. 
That's basically what it points to. I gave you a bunch of scriptures here. Um, and if you look at the, uh, there's the first three here, it's very clear. 1 Thessalonians 3.13 So that he may establish your hearts without blame and holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. That's easy. Revelation 17.14 These, meaning the ten kings, will wage war against the Lamb and the Lamb will overcome them because he is Lord of Lords and King of Kings. And those who are with him are called chosen and faithful. Okay, we've been called chosen and faithful. Matthew 16, 27, For the Son of Man is going to come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and will then repay every man according to their deeds. And this goes on and on. Deuteronomy, Psalms, Zechariah, Matthew 25. I gave you all the verses there. Uh, too much to read. It all shows either in one place where he's coming with the saints, and another place <coughs> coming with the angels. They're all talking about the same event. So they're all coming together. I can't imagine. It's almost like he's cleaning out heaven. Come on, let's get to earth. Let's beat them all up. I, I can't imagine <laughs> all the saints going with the Lord and all the angels are just kind of milling about in heaven. <clears throat> I think they're all coming. I think everyone's going to be there. It's going to be It's going to be huge. As I said, I'm, I'm like, my mind is boggled to imagine how many people that would be. How many believers have there been since the Lord walked the earth? I mean, you're talking billions in the sky. That alone will blot out the sun. It's going to be a neat event. Now, the word becomes flesh. Uh, Revelation 19, 15. From his mouth comes a sharp sword, so that with it he may strike down the nations. Now, is there a literal, literal sword that comes out of his mouth? No, it's him. No. He's saying. Nope. It's the word, right? Mm -hmm. it's the, the sword is the word of God. Ephesians 6, 17 says... And take the helm of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Hebrews 4.12, For the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It pierces even to the dividing of soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It is able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Hosea 6.5, Therefore I have uh, hewn them in pieces by the prophets. I have slain them by the words of my mouth. And the judgments on you are like the light that goes forth. So constantly you see the words coming out are judgment. The words coming out inspect. The words coming out destroy. His word is all he needs. This reminded me of something in the scriptures. See, if you go back to Revelation 19, 13, it says exactly, he is clothed with a robe dipped in blood and his name is called the word of God. He is the word. Now, to understand that, we've got to look at some things here. John 1, uh, 1 through 5. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that had been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. So he was with God. He's the Word. <coughs> Colossians 1, 15 through 17. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him, and by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. So, Jesus is the word, Right? By the spoken word, all things were created. So I was trying to put this all together for you in a way that's it's easy to understand. It's his word that keeps it all together. At the same time, his word can take it apart. He was there with the Lord in the beginning, with God. And you call, call God the Lord, you call Jesus Lord, right? So here we'll call Jesus Lord. The Lord was with God in the very beginning. And as God wants something done and it is spoken... That word becomes reality through Jesus. He is the word. The things that Jesus says, speaks, or does can come to pass. If he says, let there be light, that word translates through Jesus somehow that he makes a son with nothing in his hands. 
coming out of nowhere. He can get the elements that he needs and just say, make there, let there be a sun, let there be a moon, let there be dry ground, let the waters part. He can tell it what to do by just word. And it seems as though the word being vibration, right? If you look at sound waves, right? It's a vibration. Maybe he's able to tune things to do what it wants by his voice. God saying, let there be light. That word that he was spoken is traveling through space right now to the farthest ends of the universe. Probably still creating as it goes because they're, they're looking through telescopes. We're watching stars be born. We're watching planets. We're watching all this because it is a sound that you can't take back. You can't take back your words. And they're out there. That word has power coming out through the mouth of Jesus. He says, we all have power like him. They marveled what he did. He said, why do you marvel? You'd be able to do much greater things than this. He tells us we have the power because the Holy Spirit is in us. And if we speak it, doing work for the Lord, that it's supposed to have power. He sent out the 72, gave them power. They came back so excited. The demons listen to us. We raise the dead. How do they do that? By just thinking about it? Or do they say something? They spoke. They, they spoke. they went out. They cast out demons. They healed people. They went out and spoke it and believed it. He gave them that ability. We've somehow lost that ability to do that or have the faith to understand, the faith to do it, the faith to try. We've somehow lost that. For years, that's what they did. Paul goes out and raises a man from the dead. He fell out of a window. Boom, three floors. He goes over and lays hands on him. Come on, get up. You know, let's get back up and teach. Let's go learn the word here. Let's go. <laughs> it, it's just the power they had, and we can't understand that. But God's word goes forth. He doesn't need a sword. He doesn't need a weapon. He's got the word. If he says, from dust you were created, and he breathed life into them, what about the enemy? He says, return to dust. That army standing in front of him. <laughs> or he'd say, life leave you. And he can say one thing directed at that group, and everyone dies in one second. So he doesn't need a sword. He has to speak it. That's what's really neat. So he is the word of God. Through him, all things were created and have their being. They were created for him, and by him, he could destroy them. It's that simple. Now, let's move on. A rod of iron, Revelation 19, 15, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. Does anybody remember, we talked about this back in Revelation 2. I don't know how many were here in the very beginning. We, were you here? Yeah. Do you remember what that meant? The rod of iron? They were talking about potters in that particular context, uh, or, or context, that the potter would make these pots and then he'd have a servant go out and check them before they were sold. They don't want junk going out there and, and making their name bad. So the, the servant would go out and get the pot, he would look at it and go, ah, oh, there's a blemish here. He would get a rod of iron and smash this. They would take these over here in the little pile and smash them. He pick up another one. Well, that was good. He pick it up. No, nope, it's gonna be smashed. He would break it because once it's hardened and ready for sale, if there's a blemish. It's useless. I don't think they ever thought about a second hand shop. I think they just <laughs> they just said, "I had to destroy it. Everything was perfect." Can you imagine all your work you did. A little bit of blemish. Now we don't want that. Destroy that. That's quite a that's quite an artesian. You could destroy all your stuff that slightly was off. So the rod of iron was used for inspection and destruction of things that shouldn't be. So that's what it's going to be like for us when he is in charge with a rod of iron. He will have a rod of inspection. Will he beat us with it? I don't believe so. But it's more of his inspection and authority. And if people are doing something wrong in the thousand year reign, he is the benevolent dictator. Okay, He's going to have this rod of iron that he's going to say, I know what you've been doing. Come here. <laughs> you need to, you know, and you're going to be, yes, sir. I, I didn't realize you could see that. And yes, and, and angels, whatever, Christians, come train this person. You're going to have a time when he is going to be the leader with an iron rod that he sees everything and nothing escapes. 
He's also the shepherd. So you can look at it both ways. The shepherd had two tools, a hook, right? So they had a shepherd's hook, and then they had a rod or a staff. The staff was usually a long rod with a knot on the end. Like you would take a tree where it connected to the, uh, where the branch connected to the tree, you cut out that area and have a big round knot on the end that was carved. They would protect the flock. So the hook was for grabbing that lamb when it went someplace it shouldn't have got to, it was going into a hole and you can't get him. You'd grab it around his neck and pull him back out. Over here, a wolf came. You'd crack him in the head with that long pole with a knot on the end. So just like his rod of iron is a rod of inspection, so to speak, it is also our protection because he will not allow anything to happen in the thousand-year reign that is going to bring people to sin. He is going to be protecting us. Then when the thousand years are over, then you see the Antipathetic, um, you see Satan is released from hell, from his prison, and he's going to go out to deceive the nations once more. It's our last and final test. At that point, he's not going to be defending us anymore with the rod. It's going to be like one last test. And then he knows who we're truly his. But at this point, you have a thousand year of testing, a thousand year period of testing, and he's going to roll with a rod of iron. Um, move on. The Great Harvest, Revelation 19.15. And he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God, the Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of Kings, Lord of Lords. We see this mirrored in Joel 3. Joel 3, 11 through 13. Hasten and come, all you surrounding nations, and gather yourselves here. Bring down, O Lord, your mighty ones. Let the nations be aroused and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat. For there I will sit to judge all the surrounding nations. Put in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come tread, for the wine press is full. The vats overflow, for their wickedness is great. So we already saw here in Revelation 14, when Israel was in Petra, the Lord came down to rescue Israel in Petra. Petra was surrounded by the enemies. The Lord wipes them out in seconds. And it says in many scriptures, I went over this last week, he did it by himself. He says, no man was with me. He had no angels to help him. Each man did it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get Israel rescued. And while I'm here, you know, I said, he cracks his knuckles, <laughs> cracks his neck. He's, I'm going to have a little uh, warm-up session. And he destroys all these people around the, uh, Petra. That's why he's soaked in blood. This picture is going to happen again here when he returns. So he's already crushed them like grapes, as Revelation 14 says. And the angel said, thrust in your sickle because the grapes are ripe. Go crush them in the, in the great wine press of God's wrath. He is going to do the same thing again when he gets back here. He's just going to destroy them and crush them like grapes. So that's what, what I was saying before. Using the word, his power is so amazing. Could you imagine? He comes back and there is, let's say, 2 million, 3 million, 5 million people standing there for battle. And he says, you are crushed like grapes. And instantly, you're flat. And all the blood that's in your body runs all the way to the Mediterranean Sea. Could you imagine the power that he wields? And that's what's, that's what's going to happen. He's coming back again. And he's going to wipe everybody out. Now, moving on. The Great Supper of God, Revelation 19. 17 through 18. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried out with a loud voice, saying to all the birds which fly in mid heaven, Come, assemble for the great supper of God, so that you may eat the flesh of kings, and the flesh of commanders, and the flesh of mighty men, and the flesh of horses, and those who sit on them, and the flesh of all men, both free men and slaves, and small and great. Here we see an angel glorified by the sun. It could be the angel over the sun. But it seems as though, because he's speaking to the birds in mid-heaven, that he is in the air, standing where the sun is, and he's given glory by the sun. He's speaking to the birds. Basically, whether he's standing in the sun, he's standing in front of the sun, he's in the air talking to the birds. The whole point is, he is gathering the birds and getting them ready. Why? There's going to be a lot to eat. Hmm. There's going to be a big feast. Just like the wedding feast of the Lamb is coming as... as we're all coming back down with the Lord, and then we're going to have a wedding feast in heaven, in, in the New Jerusalem. You're now seeing 
a supper which you don't want to be invited to. <laughs> Remember we talked about last week when you're invited to the, the supper of the lamb or the, um, the, the wedding feast of the lamb? That's going to be an amazing thing. You've been invited to spend eternity with God. This one over here, it's a different kind of dinner. You don't want to go to this one. Yeah, come birds, come on down. You're going to have a lot to eat. You're going to be eating for weeks. There's going to be bodies everywhere. He's got to have something clean it up. So he's going to have the birds come and do all the job, because that's what they do. The vultures will come down, the eagles, the hawks. That's what they're birds of prey. They're going to come down and grab all that meat and eat it up. He destroys them, the birds clean it up. He's got a pretty good system going on. <laughs> Um, this was prophesied in Ezekiel 39, 17 through 20. As for you, son of man, thus says the Lord God, speak to every kind of bird and every beast of the field, assemble and come, gather from every side to my sacrifice, which I'm going to sacrifice for you as a great sacrifice on the mountains of Israel, that you may eat flesh and drink blood. You will eat the flesh of mighty men and drink the blood of the princes of the earth as though they were rams, uh, rams, lambs, goats, and bulls, all of them fatlings in Bashan. You will eat fat until you are gutted and drink blood until you are drunk from my sacrifice, which I have sacrificed for you. You will be glutted at my table with horses and charioteers, with mighty men, and all the men of war, declares the Lord God. And when he tells us these things in the Old Testament, they're coming to <coughs> there, you, you, There's no denying this word of God is true. <clears throat> And when people see this, I mean, when you see any of this, up to that point, obviously, there's time to repent. At this point here, it's too late. <laughs> we've seen so much, and we've talked about prophecy before in the Word of God, that's how God validates the Word. He gives us prophecy that is not vague. He didn't say, one day there'll be a Savior coming. It will be a person. They'll be born in a certain county. They will... Walk around. They're going to teach nice things. And they're going to do other things for people. It's very vague. No, he says, it'll be he. This will be from his family line. This will be his name. This is exactly where he's going to be born. Exactly where he's going to live. And he's going to live here. This is exactly what he's going to do in his ministry. This is exactly what he's going to say. This is the exact time he is going to come into Jerusalem. 483 years to the day when he's going to come. A prophecy 483 years before he was coming into Jerusalem says he will come in on that day. And it came to pass. We have the prophecy, 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 prophecy all throughout the word of God. People can today see that this book is trustworthy and, and true and they won't do it. They will not believe this. I could go talk to somebody, Stephen Sensei. Can I show you something? I found something through studies that this book is amazing, the only one of its kind in the entire world. And you try to show them, they go, nah. They will still have time to repent. They're going to see what is written here, Old and New Testament, coming to pass. They can still change. Are they going to? It says they don't repent. In the, at here in the, in the um, seventh bowl, it says that they still don't repent and they still curse God. You can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink, right? It's, it's all that we're just seeing this play out. Luckily, we're going to be part of the winning team. But we keep trying to show people the truth. I had a debate with somebody this weekend online, and, and I said, Look, this is what it says. This is the only book you can trust. They said, no, I don't want that. I don't want part of that. You can't force them. You just can't. But you can lead them there. That's our job, is to lead them. So you see this prophecy being. Spoken of a long time ago. God already showed them this is exactly what's going to happen to people. Wake up. That imagery alone of birds and animals coming and eating the flesh of all these mighty men, it's kind of creepy. But that's not the world God wants. Don't ever look at this like God is a vindictive God who has planned to kill all these people. He has to. He's pushed to. And he sees it coming. So he wants everyone to get saved. Please get saved. You want to know what's coming? This is coming. Do you want that? And he's telling them this is going to come. And they still don't hear. They still don't want to know. And that's sad. It's, I'm glad I got saved when I did. I'm glad I looked at my life and said, I'm going to hell. The way I'm living is putting me right to hell. 
I need to change. And it was his word that changed my life, right? By hearing the word of God. And most people just don't want to hear now, especially when the world gives you so much. Everything you need is on every corner. I can go get a Big Mac. I can go get a new sweater, whatever. I can go get my tires fixed. I can get a car. I can travel. I can do whatever I want. I don't need God. We're in a world that does not need him, but oh, they need him. <laughs> now, they only do. Now, this is interesting. The birds of the air are coming down, right? And as I'm reading that, I'm thinking, there's something to that. As maybe God's given me a little nudge. Remember the birds. Remember the birds. And I'm thinking about that. Look at Matthew 24. I'm going to try to cut it down so we, don't, we only have a little bit of time here to read. Um, when, in Matthew 24, it's talking about when you see the abomination of desolation standing in the holy place, okay, Israel flee. That's here. They flee to Petra when they see that. For then there will be great tribulation, verse 21, such as not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever will. And then skip to verse 26. So if they say to you, behold, he's in the wilderness, do not go out. Or behold, he's in the inner rooms, do not believe them. For just as the lightning comes from the east and flashes even to the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man be. Wherever the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. So you see in that last verse there, 28, where the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. So I said, that's, that's interesting. Luke 17, 30 through 37, I'll give you a little quick overview. It says, just as it happened in the days of Noah, and then down 28, just as the same happened in the days of Lot. Both those are talking about they were rescued before the wrath. Because it says in 29 years, but on that day that Lot went out from Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone. Here for Noah, 28. It was the same as happened in the days of Lot, right? They, I'm sorry, I'm wrong verse. Um, until the day Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. So it's a picture. There's wrath coming. But when Noah left and went to his place of safety, then the wrath came. For Lot, when Lot left, the wrath came. The holy people can't be there for that. So he's giving you a picture before he wraps this up. He <coughs> says on verse 29, But on that day that Lot went out from Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. It will be just the same on the day that the Son of Man is revealed. On that day, the one who is on the housetop and whose goods are in that house must not go down to take them out. And likewise, the one who is in the field must not turn back. Remember Lot's wife. Whoever seeks to keep his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life will preserve it. I tell you that on that night there will be two in one bed. One will be taken and the other left. There will be two women grinding in the same place. One will be taken and the other left. Two men will be in the field, one will be taken, and the other will be left. And answering them, they said to him, Where, Lord? So the <laughs> meaning, someone's taken. Where are they taken to? They don't understand what he's saying. He says, Where, Lord? And he said to them, Where the body is, there also the vultures will be gathered. If you look at Matthew 24, it says the corpse. Where the corpse is. The battle, the great supper, where the corpse is, you'll see the birds. Who's going to be there also? The multitude. They're coming with the Lord. Luke 21, where the body is. Where were they taken, Lord? Where the body is, there in the air, the, the vultures will be gathered. That's what will be taken to the air. So you see, he uses a similar analogy. And if someone just puts those two verses together, you'd say, well, he's talking about the same thing. It's talking about the same event, but it's looking at it from two different ways. The book of Luke was written to the Gentiles, and as I explained, Luke 21 shows a pre-tribulation rapture of his people. Matthew 20, or Matthew was written to the Jews, and Matthew 24 specifically shows that the Jews must go through the tribulation. There's two different views. The one in Luke shows people gathered before the wrath comes and shows that they'll be taken and put somewhere. Matthew shows destruction coming and all their bodies are going to be laid on the ground. 
So if you just throw those verses together, it may sound like it's the same exact thing. And he's talking about the same point, but it's really not. When you read in context, reading, if I give you a verse to read and I say, what does it mean? You need to read the paragraph before the verse and the paragraph after the verse. Understand the entire context of what the verse is talking about before you say, oh, that means the end day. You say, well, what's the reference here? Oh, it's the corpse or the body. Why are there two different words? Some people say, well, you can use the words interchangeably. No, Jesus uses specific words to let us know specific meanings. If he meant corpse, he would have said corpse two different places. If he meant body, he would have said body in two different places. But no, one verse says where the body is, where the body is. On the other one, where the corpses are. All the armies of the world coming together, the corpses. He meant two different things and tried to show it from two different angles, from the good side and the bad side. So when you read, read in context all around, because usually the answer you need is right there. Because he gives you a sentence and he describes it and tells you what it means. Did, does that make sense, everybody? Are there any questions? Very good. Okay. Ezekiel 38 War, Revelation 19, 19. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies assembled to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. And as I said earlier, a battle against God? Really? <laughs> Think about that. The, oh, yes, the, it's going to be quick. The only way they would possibly be fighting against God is if they're told it's not God. They're all gathered together. He calls them together for battle. There's going to be a skirmish where the Antichrist is going to have to subdue uh, some of the nations that have previously given him their power. They're going to see what he's doing and they're going to say, wait a minute. I don't like what you're doing. He says, really? So the Antichrist is going to come in and squash a bunch of people. You're going to see that right around this time period here when they're getting gathered that there should be in the chapter 13 to 14 you're going to see the Antichrist going after anybody who doesn't listen to him. Then he says, gather everybody together in the plain of Megiddo. And they call it Armageddon. So in, in you've heard the, the Armageddon, uh, the War of Armageddon. That's going to be the place where it's at. Armageddon. And they're going to be there for battle. He's gathering everyone together. He's probably going to tell them we're going, to just, we're going to wipe out Israel once and for all. We're going to take the splendor. Or their, 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 we're going to plunder them, take all of their goods. We're going to do everything we want to them. Scripture shows that. I, I've given you several verses. In fact, um, I went on for probably a page and a half giving you verse, <laughs> verses from Ezekiel 38, Zechariah 14, Daniel 11, Zephaniah 3, Isaiah 5, Isaiah 66, Jeremiah 25. All of those are talking about the same battle. And they're seen in different ways. Israel's going to be punished for their lack of faith in God. But God will come back and rescue them and rescue the remnant. There's so much going on in the Ezekiel 38. I'm going to ask you to read those on your own and look through those verses and see a picture of a battle coming. See Israel in the city trying to defend herself, but they really can't. They're being, the women are being raped. Their stuff is being plundered. They're being killed. And then the Lord comes and rescues Israel. And that's what this is here. He's going to come and rescue Israel. The Antichrist gets everyone together in one place for this battle. They're all going to be together. While they're there, the Lord comes back. Prophecy is very clear that he will be coming back with his holy ones. The Antichrist knows this. He thinks there's an army coming. And he knows it according to Scripture. So he wants to make sure he has his people ready to fight against God. So imagine they're all getting together. He calls them together for, let's fight against Israel. And then suddenly, what is that? What is that in the sky? Is that a light? What? It's huge. What is that? Everyone, get your guns ready. We're going to fight against that. <laughs> I mean, it could go down that way. Unless he actually said... Get the commanders, get the generals ready. We're going to go fight God today. All right, fine. <laughs> I don't see that happening. So what's coming is 
they're going to see it, and I think they're going to turn their attention to this thing coming from space, which they're probably going to think is alien. That's the only reason you would, I think, point your gun at something coming from space. It's either God or an alien, but those people are going to think God's coming. So they're probably going to think it's an alien. Anyway, um, so where are we? In Revelation 19, I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies assembled to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. So we see that starting here in the sixth bowl, we see them waiting for this short period of time for this day. And that's what's coming to pass right now. The cast of characters for Ezekiel 38 will be Russia, Iran, Iraq, and Afghanistan, Sudan and Ethiopia, Libya, Algeria, Morocco, and Tunisia, Turkey, and Armenia. Those are the areas that the Old Testament pointed to as being part of a league that's going to come against Israel and the end of God. And they're going to lose. For the Muslims, they get the chance to finally wipe out Israel completely. For the Antichrist, he gets to gather everyone together for a battle to suit himself. For the Lord, he's waiting for the Muslims to attack Israel to get his wrath boiling, to get him really angry. Israel deserves punishment. He said, you don't follow me, you're going to be run over, you're going to be attacked, your women are going to be raped, you're going to be plundered. He says all these things happen, and it's coming to pass, and if they don't have that happen, he's not going to get... He, they're not going to get their punishment, and he's not going to get um, even with the enemies of, of God. So there's three purposes to this battle right here. Okay? We'll skip through all those verses. The battle is quick. Revelation 19, 20-21. And the beast was seized, and with him the false prophet who performed the signs in his presence, by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast, and those who worshipped his image, and those two were thrown alive into the lake of fire which burns with brimstone. And the rest were killed with the sword which came out of the mouth of him who sat on the horse, and all the birds were filled with their flesh. There's no contest. There's no time for the enemies of the Lord to even get their guns pointed in the right direction. It's going to be over in a heartbeat. Um, this is interesting. In Revelation 16, here at the... Um, yes? Time. We still got 10 minutes. Or actually, okay. 6. Um, <laughs> I'll edit that out. Um, it says, uh, Israel was split in, in... Jerusalem was split in three sections due to the earthquake in Revelation 16. In, in the seventh judgment, you have a huge earthquake, and Israel split in three. Now... Zechariah 14, 4 through 5 says, In that day his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which is in front of Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives will be split in its middle from east to west by a very large valley, so that half of the mountain will move toward the north and the other half toward the south. You will flee by the valley of my mountains, for the valley of the mountains will reach to Azale. Yes, you will flee, just as you fled before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. Then the Lord my God will come, and all the holy ones with him. Here's a pattern. Just like in the Red Sea, God parted the Red Sea and stood between the enemies of Israel and allowed Israel time to get away. Then he crushed the enemy. God split the mountain so Israel can flee. He will stand at the mountain between the enemy and Israel and then he will crush the enemy. He gave us a pattern in what happened in the Red Sea and he's going to do it again. So in the end, when he stands here, Israel has been split in three. He will be standing in Israel, and with the word of his mouth, he'll destroy the enemies. It'll be fast, easy. The birds will come, they'll eat all the flesh. Now, my conclusion to this, as I was thinking about what's God trying to show us, we sh we're all going to be sacked, right? Yeah, we beat them. We beat the enemy. We beat Satan and his demons and all this. How's God feel about destroying his children? He knit them all together in their mother's womb. He watched them learn how to speak and how to walk. He watched them as they grew and became men. He tried and tried and tried to get them to change. 
and they didn't want to change. They're still his children. It says here in Ezekiel 33, 11, Say them, as I live, declares the Lord God, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn back, turn back from your evil ways. Why then will you die, O house of Israel? He doesn't want anyone to die. He doesn't want anyone to be punished the way he's going to have to punish. But someday he's going to have to. He's going to be pushed to. We should have the same heart to rescue his people, to rescue our friends and families and neighbors. That's why I always tell, tell us at the end, go out and tell them what's coming and warn them. And right here, he says, I don't want anybody to die. We should be thinking the same way. Amen. Amen. Amen.